Welcome to the Gruber Morning Show. This is the Tessa Roadster Podcast. I'm Pete Gruber. I'm Mark Schaffner. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. And what we have behind us here today is an AI-generated image of a Tesla Roadster that is being charged. And um, I tried at least a dozen variations. It just would not plug the charge cable into that charge port door by Mark's head there. That is a very interesting wall charger sitting on the wall, though. That too, yeah. You know, that's almost a marketable item. I'll bet people would buy that. It's so uh, reminiscent of the superchargers. Oh, yes. On the wall. But anyway, so the um, Roadster podcast today is going to focus on an announcement of a new charging method that we're working on in our electronics lab. And uh, we'll get to that here uh, briefly. So one of the first things I wanted to pop up here, Jesse, was a picture of the fuse block called fuse block detail. And for those of you that have roadsters, you may not be aware where your fuses are, and they are user replaceable. It is in the passenger compartment area, uh, just below the dash, and um, behind the, um, uh, there's an access panel on the right-hand side of the dashboard. To gain access to this, um, you just simply use a flathead screwdriver, you rotate the turnbuckle 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then it releases the panel from the dashboard. And what it will expose is a fuse block that looks like that, um, uh, that image above my head there. Now, is that fuse block sitting, what, uh, kind of up under the dash onto the passenger side? Or is it over on the right side by the door? Or? It's on the passenger side underneath the rounded airbag cover. Okay. And uh, so slightly lower above the waterfall, basically, which is the part that goes down to your running board. Right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and there you can see <clears throat> what the description of the circuit breakers are, um, you know, various functions in the car. So if one of those is missing, that's a good place to look. These are automotive fuses, which if you look at them, you'll, uh, you'll see a little S-shaped uh, connection between the two pins. Uh, you can take that out, certainly, and, uh, um, and by, uh, by looking at it, you can tell if it's blown or not. Um, they do give you a warning, which, of course, is common sense. Always fit replacement fuses of the same rating and type of fuse of the matching specification. Incorrect fuse ratings may overload a system and cause a fire or malfunction. And no attempt should be made to repair a fuse that has blown. A uh, pretty common sense thing. Yeah. You know, don't put a 20 amp fuse into a 10 amp socket. And uh, just because you keep blowing your 10 amp fuse, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Another um, uh, news item here. Um, there are a number of Tesla Roadster uh, experts beginning to emerge around the planet. And yeah. um, it's rewarding to see that because even though the service centers are still, uh, many of them are still accepting Roadsters, this uh, this additional augmentation makes the options for a customer much, uh, you know, better. Oh, I love this story that's coming up. Yeah. So this was from um, the uh, Tessa Roadster Owners Group, and um, turns out that in the UK, Andy Nickel is developing a lot of expertise. He has bought three Roadsters already, bought them from Japan, I believe, and um He's, we've been talking to him and we've been uh, collaborating and consulting on various items on what to do with mm -hmm. the roadsters. Well, apparently, um, VIN number 19 in Oslo, Norway, um, was ailing. And um, the, uh, the customer reached out to the community seeking help. And this was just last week or the week before. And uh, unfortunately, this roadster was left in the cold Norwegian winter at a low state of charge and then was bricked or unable to accept power through the charge port. So uh, it turns out Andy flew to Norway, and um, after the service center attempted a repair, they changed a 12-volt battery, and then it was declared hopeless. Because remember, the service centers are not equipped to go inside the battery pack right. and do repairs. Their, their most uh, effective option is a in this case, a $50,000 battery replacement, because in the U.S. it's $40,000 plus tax, but with shipping and, you know, customs, that's going to increase the cost. So anyway, Andy stepped up to the plate. He flew over uh, Easter break to assist, and um, anyway, the customer was uh, impressed by this, and then Andy reached out to us. Um, 
he had begun a recovery process, which of course is what we call a level one recovery, where you trickle charge the battery up to a certain voltage level. And the voltage that he saw, which is called in the critical power world, the string voltage, which is now yes. being adopted here for the, uh, in, the, um, um, in the Roadster world or in the EV world, was around 210 volts DC which is a easily recovery um a easily recoverable battery pack it's when you get down into the under 100 we had one just recently we did that was 37 volts right and that's a bit tougher to bring back to the 400 volts that it's supposed to be or you may have some damage in the bricks uh which are in the sheets so he ended up uh beginning a uh, trickle charge and uh, he was able to get just overnight the um, uh, the voltage up to 350 volts DC. And this was with a 400-volt charger. Now, we recommend that you keep the milliamps low. This particular charger that he used is good for 400 milliamps, which is just under a half an amp. Mm -hmm. But 300 milliamps is a safe um, charge method to use for a level one recovery. And at 330 volts, the car will actually wake up which means if you leave the service plug in, which of course you shouldn't, you should take all the drain off the battery, right. the car will suddenly start chirping at around 330 volts and saying, hey, I'm waking up here, but there's something wrong. I, you know, the voltage yeah. is too low. Help, I need something, you know, and I need a charge port uh, 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 type charge. So at 350 volts, it turns out that uh, the car still would not accept a charge from the charge port door, which indicates another problem in the car. So the first thing we asked for was a log file, and um, this was over um, uh, Easter uh, holiday. By the way, I want to insert something else here. Gruber Motor Company is available to the Roadster owners 24-7. It doesn't matter whether it's a holiday, if it's the middle of the night, you text us, you email us, and uh, someone will eventually respond to you. We feel that these roadsters are very important, and yes. uh, especially when you have a crisis like this, where uh, you know hours or days could make a critical difference between saving a roadster or having it expire into permanent brickness. Well, and considering what was happening on this roadster, um, having a response within a few hours could have meant the difference between the roadster being uh, a roadster and being a pile of ash on the floor. All right, okay, which is where we're headed with this. It turns out the log file disclosed that there was the lowest brick reading was 0.71 volts, which is dangerously low because anything under two volts begins a uh, destructive chemical process mm -hmm. in the 18650 lithium ion cells. And of course, in a brick, they all look the same. So if you have 0.71 volts in a brick, that means you've got 69 cells at that voltage level. Right. The highest one, though, was of great concern. It read 4.99 volts. It was sheet number five. And, um, you know, at 4.2 volts is the maximum level for the 18650 cell. You get too much beyond that, and now you have a fire risk. Right. So we suspect that there was something else wrong, but we, we, advised, um, uh, we advised Andy at that point, take the charge off and uh, start draining the car. And what Andy then did was, it turns out the Tesla Service Center had pulled the BMB um, cards or the boards. Okay. Well, one of those being reseeded is what brought the car back to normal. And at that point, he was then able to do a charge. So they had pulled the BMB boards, but they had not reseeded and re put them all back properly. It was actually Andy that reseeded them. And, uh, you know, when you put them back in, there's a positive click, and sometimes you have to do it a couple times. Yeah. The, the physics behind this, by the way, there is an explanation. When Tesla was looking for a plug and socket combination for the BMB boards on the Tesla Roadster sheet, they ended up going looking for connectors and, mm -hmm. and uh, socket combinations, plug and socket combinations. And they couldn't find quite what they wanted in the automotive world. So they ended up using a clothes dryer plug socket combination which isn't quite as robust as an automotive application where you have constant vibration, extreme right. uh, you know, temperature variations, and the need to service it from time to time means plug and unplug because that always stresses any kind of a uh, plug uh, socket combination. Sure. 
you get flayed pins eventually if you uh, plug and unplug too much because they're actually closed like this, and as you continue to plug and unplug, they open up, okay. which is a common problem with these BMB sockets. In fact, one of the repairs we do, we go through and we actually look for those. Okay. So it turns out that by simply plugging the BNB board back in, plugging and unplugging, it put this car back on track and it began to take a charge. And the last video that I saw, there was a proud owner driving a very orange Tesla Roadster around Norway again. That's such a great story. Just not, you know, it's, and it's not only uh, the, the I don't want to minimize the role of the Tesla Service Center. These batteries are uh, literally and figuratively to them a black box. They don't know what's inside them. They're not trained to know what's inside them. In at fact, the, they're they're yeah, told at very the service specifically. Center yeah, level. At the let's service let, center yeah, let's level. Let's qualify that. They're told very specifically if you think there's something that's going to go on with the high voltage battery pack, then the, your only option is a replacement. Mm -hmm. That's what they're told at the service center. So we have a guy who's come in and uh, working with us and able to take and restore and save this car. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Yeah. And, you know, hats off to Andy uh, for a number of reasons, taking the time to fly out there. Uh, when we got him that log file result, he was apparently in his hotel. Um, he was motivated enough to jump into a taxi in the middle of the night and go back to the car at that point in time to make sure that, you know, there wasn't a problem with that uh, almost five volts mm -hmm. on that one brick. So it looks like we've got some evolving uh, expertise that is growing in Europe at this point and continuing to expand. Now, there's also Neil Wise in the UK who does wonderful work. Uh, you know, these guys are, they're, they're pioneers. Uh, they are reverse engineering like we did, and they're, um, they're learning how to keep these roadsters on the road, which is a great benefit to the community and the roadster owners. All right, um, we've got another image here, Jesse. If you can pop up um, rodent, actually, let's do the rodent picture first. Why isn't that in here? All right. Never mind. Yeah, I know, but there's one with the rodents all over it. And uh, let me see if I can find that in the... Uh... While you're looking for that, uh, Herbert Buter has joined us. Uh, he says, good morning from Dusseldorf. Uh, good evening, Herbert. Uh, he says, uh, today is live on our show again. Looking forward to an interesting hour. Glad to have you on and welcome. Yeah, thanks uh, for joining us. And I'm going to put that picture in there. I thought this was a picture that drives home the point. That's why I wanted to. I'm going to copy it in there, Jesse. And it is called uh, Rodent Pick. Now, we, we're kind of beating a dead horse here, it seems like. But we're, we continue to see rodent damaged roadsters. And not just roadsters. We had a couple Model S's recently as well. Yeah. You know, these things are getting into the cars. And although this is an over-dramatization and the size of these critters is nowhere near what's going to go in your car, this is basically what happens. They begin feasting on the car. And it becomes pretty expensive because they can get into nooks and crannies that we can't get into easily. Yeah. And when they chew through the wiring harnesses in those areas, it becomes a, a more complex repair. So... What our engineers have done is they begin to investigate product. And this is where the next picture comes in. If you can bring up rodent, Jesse. Get, get those South American rodents off the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those look like big guinea pigs, don't they? They do. The, I, I think they call them pachyberas or something like that. Cabbies or something like that. Cabbara, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So um, we've been um, experimenting with some different solutions. The one toward the bottom, if you could scroll up a bit there, Jesse, uh, which is the... There's no scroll. Oh, there isn't. Make, okay. Yeah, just make it a little smaller okay. would be fine. Actually, the next picture then, if you want to bring that up, this is a uh, ultrasonic uh, uh, rodent repellent. It's an electronic device that emits frequencies. And you can buy this on Amazon. You can see 25 bucks, money well spent. The Patler rodent repellent for car engines under hood, ultrasonic animal repellent with connection to 12 volt car battery. So there's some simple instructions here, how to tap into or how to connect this to your 12 volt system. And what it then does is, I, this is what I envision. It makes a really annoying noise 
that the rodents don't want to be around and they won't go in your car. Sure, okay. It's a basic uh, explanation. And then there's also that chemical, which uh, most likely has to be applied periodically. And that little sprig off to the side there indicates there's mint involved because apparently uh, smaller rodents don't like mint. So this is what we're experimenting with now after we do a rodent repair. We're actually going to give you an option to have these kinds of things used or installed in your car. And uh, you also uh, yeah. always remember off to the right there, you have mouse out as well. We do, yeah. We've got that mouse out spray that George gave us. Um, it's another alternative, a little cheaper too. Yeah. So um, it's money well spent in our opinion because we've seen some of these disasters and um, there's also a sanitation issue. You know, they don't, uh, they don't have an outhouse that they bring with them when they take up residence in your car. Your car becomes the outhouse. And uh, so you have some, uh, uh, yeah. you know, some sanitation type issues and some health issues with these kinds of things getting in your car. Uh, you know, funny story here. Um, there was a coyote sighted uh, just a couple of days ago here outside okay. of Gruber Motor Company. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, that's not a bad thing because you'll keep the rabbits away or, you know, anything yeah. else that might be causing issues. Well, yesterday um, uh, they called me up in the conference room, Nicole, and she says, I think we've had critters in here. And sure enough, on the conference room floor upstairs here, there was uh, two urine stains and some droplets that look like black rice, even oh, on the chair. Boy. So my, my thinking is perhaps whatever was outside taking up residence sensed that there was a coyote in the neighborhood now, and they're moving indoors. Yeah, probably. You know, the, uh, when I, sometimes on the weekends, I'll come park in the building, see here, and I'll just walk around the neighborhood, get some exercise. Every time I'm walking and there's not a lot of traffic, I see at least two or three rabbits. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're in the bushes all around the, the complex here. Yeah. What we need is a barn cat mm -hmm. or the coyote hangs around for a while. Yeah. You know, we've had, we've had cats in the compound before mm -hmm. too. Um, when I first came to work here about 10 years ago, there was a, a resident cat and had been here for a few years and, yeah. uh, and he, he lived underneath one of the sea containers, if I recall correctly. Well, he or she is still here, by the way. But that particular uh, uh, mouse uh, fixer is not going down a group motor company, which is about, what, 500 feet away or yeah, so. Yeah, I probably wouldn't do that. So, yeah, we need a different uh, solution there. So for those of you that have roadsters, it is becoming a problem, or maybe always has been, and people just hadn't noticed, but eventually they will kill your car. It will get in. They will chew on the wiring harnesses, which is going to disable different functions in the car. All right. <clears throat> Let's see what else we have here. So for those of you interested in buying it, we're trying out this $25 item from, uh, uh, from Amazon. There's a Tessa Roadster that is on its second go around or was on Bring a Trailer. And uh, it is um, VIN number 848. Um, it is a 2010 Tessa Roadster Sport 2.25 modified a bit because it was one of the last ones mm -hmm. that was converted. Um, the first time it sold for $69,500, which is way low for a functioning roadster, but you know, what, what are you going to do? The auctions don't do a great job of getting the valuation up there or the prices up. But for some reason, the buyer uh, did not take possession of the car. It was then offered on a website for $75,000. No one pulled the trigger on that. It went back to bring a trailer, actually, and uh, it just sold uh, yesterday, or three thirty-one, for seventy-one thousand dollars. So we got another fifteen hundred dollars out of it this time. But um, again, it's still really low. It is, and uh, it it looks like a nice car. The CAC was a bit low; it was one hundred and nineteen um, charges to one forty-three, one forty-five in standard mode. But again, a uh, intact, fully functioning radiant red roadster that uh finally sold so let's see if this buyer comes through yeah i'm sure that bring a trailer was not terribly upset because they get their fees regardless mm -hmm. uh, if not from the seller from the buyer when they do that so islander says that picture is funny is too funny uh, too many rats. Yeah, I yeah. can't describe the number of factory electrical panels I've been in direct, in the direct, and got there first. 
Um, yeah, it used to be when I did tower work up on mountaintops um, back east where, you know, it gets yeah. very cold. These, um, these uh, transmitter shacks generally are not environmentally controlled, but there's enough heat being generated in those from vacuum tubes back then okay. that it would warm it up somewhat. And all the critters in the countryside would seek out that warm area and then take up residence in these high voltage transmitter cabinets. And every once in a while when we got called out and a transmitter was down, it wasn't uncommon to see a mouse strung between the B-plus plates inside the oh, transmitter cage, man. completely fried, you know? Oh, yes. Like in those cartoons where you've got nothing but charcoal in the shape of a mouse. Oh. Um, Highlander says, all good factories have a factory cat that keeps down the mice. You keep down the mice, you keep down the rats. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's interesting, and I, I, I would totally agree with that. Yep. We've got a customer in Canada that has a Roadster, and uh, it is actually VIN number. Let me see if I have that here. Uh, it's very low. Um, VIN number 26, I think it is. Yeah, I don't have it in this list here. Um, but anyway, um, there was a switch. It's at a service center, Tesla service center up in Canada. And uh, it looked like the switch pack was having a problem. Mm -hmm. What was remarkable was Tesla was actually able to find a switch pack, a 1.5 switch pack. Wow. They said it's the last one in their inventory system, and they got it all the way from Belgium. So it got shipped up here to Canada. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, it turns out that the uh, switch pack was not the cause of the problem. It solved some other problems, but not all of them. So it still has a 420 error at this point, which is now pointing at the APS unit inside the ESS battery pack. What that is, is inside the 1,000-pound battery pack, you have a DC to DC converter, which takes the 400-volt DC from the main battery pack and converts it to low-voltage 12 volts for all of your locks, uh, you know, audio equipment, uh, mm -hmm. uh, headlights, any of the illuminating devices, the VMS module, anything that runs off 12 volts. Well, they're thinking that the problem is in this uh, APS unit, and because it's such a low VIN, this is one of the older MarTech APS units. Tesla had vendors, two vendors for this DC to DC converter. The first one was MarTech, which um, wasn't a great design. It has a lot of potting compound, and in order to repair it, these things weren't really uh, built originally to be repaired. Right. What we end up having to do is an archaeological dig literally digging down through the potting compound to get at the MOSFETs, the caps, the transformers, or whatever is buried underneath all that. The later version was a Delta uh, version, which is much more serviceable. It didn't have all that potting compound. Well, this okay. has the older MarTech. And um, the way that Tesla is going to handle this repair, since they don't go inside the battery pack, pull anything out, and then do a repair, they're going to have to ship the whole battery pack back to Lathrop, California, which is the remand center where they build all of the, um, uh, the Tesla 3.0 mm -hmm. replacement battery packs. So um, anyway, this one is, is going to continue to um, uh, be out of play. Unfortunately, the, uh, where he lives, this is driving season, or he's going into driving season. And of course, it's another six months or so until he's going to get his car back. Oh, that's so sad because he's yeah. going to get it back and it's going to be fall time. The driving season's going to be just about over. And then it becomes garage furniture again. Yes. Yeah. But um, the good news is, is that Tesla is diagnosing. Um, they are sending um, experts out to these service centers, and uh, they are able to uh, diagnose and eventually repair these cars. That's good. Um, Herbert Booter says he's going to meet up with Rafael de Mestri at Hilden, South Carolina Park, planned on the 20th of April. Okay. A Roadster meeting organized by Roland Schuren. According to Life Tracker, Rafael is in Oktober, Kazakhstan just now. So he's, he's in his roadster traveling again. Yes. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun, Herbert. Um, while you're in the U.S., if you can head out west, we'd love to have you take a tour of our Phoenix, Arizona Gruber Motor Company facility. And uh, I'm going to be in Europe the uh, 25th and 24th, 5th, and 6th of May at the uh, Tesla Takeover in uh, Flachau, Austria, outside of Salzburg. 
So if you're planning on going to that, I'll, I'll get to meet you in person. By the way, we should probably give that, uh, uh, that event a, a, a plug at this point. Um, this is the first European Tesla takeover, mm -hmm. and uh, they've done three of them in the U.S. They were highly successful, so much so that the Europeans decided we want to do this too. So a number of Tesla clubs from all over Europe are going to be there. They say that a thousand cars, Tesla cars, are going to be there, which of course means even more, uh, you know, attendees because oftentimes there's more than one person in the car. Oh yes. Um, the official dates are the 25th and 26th. We'll be there the 24th, the day before. Um, the event will have a wide array of speakers, workshops, live music, light shows, and so much more. And as they say, it's an, uh, an opportunity to bring the Tesla community together all in one place. There are a number of keynote speakers that will be there, and uh, a lot of uh, European service um, uh, people will be there as well. So it's well worth attending. Oh, I'm sorry. Herbert Booter says, Hilden SC Supercharger. Okay, I thought you were talking about <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> in Düsseldorf, near Düsseldorf. Okay, so it's, it's still in Germany. And um, yeah, so that may be an event going too. Um, and what were the dates, Jesse? If you can bring that down, I'll uh, I'll uh, read that again. That's when um, Rafael de Mestri will be there, and it's planned on the twentieth of April. So that's just around the corner here. All right. So it's not going to take him too long to get out of Kazakhstan and head over to Germany, it sounds like. Oh, it's, I was just looking at the map, and it looks like he's uh, more than halfway across the Asian continent toward Europe. So it looks like he's doing well on his trip. He's such a pioneer when it comes to uh, traveling, especially with the roadster. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, uh, it's remarkable what, all that he does. and the, the, I mean, the roadster is not... The most comfortable trip car. It's not, no. Yeah, he is a true pioneer, um, again, promoting alternative energy use. And uh, he even plants trees when he goes to some of these places. So mm -hmm. he's, uh, having spent some time with him, he is an inspiration. Um, all right, so Herbert Booter, we've got that. Highlander, will Raphael be in Michigan? Michigan on the June 15th. It's a huge test level event. I don't think Raphael is scheduled to come back to the U.S. for some time. Uh, but anyway, if that changes, we'll certainly report it on this podcast. Yeah. So getting now to the primary theme of this podcast, and I'm going to take you through some history here. The first Tesla Roadster charge plug was this monstrosity that's mounted on this Can Junior. And I didn't want to bring the whole cable, but normally the exit point here would go to a yellow cable, 12 feet long. And uh, then this connector becomes the proprietary Tesla Roadster charge plug and socket combination. No other EV manufacturer that we are aware of ended up using this standard because they immediately jumped from there to the J1772 standard, before the next standard, by the way. Um, these plugs for the Roadster have been out of production for some time now, and we have been searching to find those plugs because there are times when the owners have a faulty plug, a broken plug, they yep. ran over it, flattened it out somewhat. It's not repairable. So we're needing plugs. Well, we've been searching for vendors to do this, and we finally found the right vendor for this. I'll get into that, but let me take you some more through some more history here. So by the time J1772 came out, the Roadsters were already out in the wild, and Tesla was not going to adopt a different charge standard, have half the cars be the proprietary plug here, and the other ones be a J1772. So they continued with this for the Roadster until completion. They also developed some wall chargers, or had commission companies to develop mm -hmm. them. The Suntron wall charger, for example, it's a large thing, larger than the Clipper Creek, that works fine with a 1.5, but has problems with the 2.0 roadsters. A ground imbalance often causes problems. So Tesla then commissioned Clipper Creek to develop a TS-70 charger, which is a 70 amp charger. I've got pictures of this, Jesse. If you want to bring up 
um, charging options that will put a visual to some of these things that we're describing right now. And these became the preferred charging methods for the Tesla Roadster. The one on the left is the Clipper Creek TS70. Good for 70 amps. You can get a full charge within under four hours on a Tesla Roadster with this charger. Pretty impressive. It requires a 100 amp service in your home. Um, you could squeak by with 80, but we recommend 100 amps to feed this beast. And they are virtually indestructible. When they do break, we repair them. People ship them to us. And uh, they are definitely a, um, a bulletproof type charger. The one in the middle is the MC240. That's a 240 volt charger. Again, also has this plug on the end for the Tesla Roadster. None of these, by the way, will charge your um, Model X, Model S, Model Y, or any of the NACS uh, charging systems. And then finally, we have the yellow charge cable to the right, which is the MC120. We ended up, um, uh, let's see here. So yeah, so we started to investigate finding these plugs, and we now have a vendor that is capable of reproducing these and it's the original vendor that was making them so we think that their product is going to be right on target that will now allow us to repair any of these three or even four chargers including the suntron if the connector is broken the proprietary tesla charge plug and the way you break those is you drive over them and they don't like that they typically won't uh, bounce back but we decided to go a step further we decided, you know, the um, Tesla Roadster has been using the um, socket. In fact, I have some behind me here. Let me see if I can grab those without getting my headset on. Yeah, and while, uh, while Pete's grabbing that, Squeaky Clean Air is asking, um, is there an Instagram for the uh, Tesla Takeover Europe? Yeah, I put those uh, links on Instagram for him. Okay, you thank, you. thank you. Yeah, I found a couple of, uh, there's an Instagram, it's the Tesla Club Austria, and then I put the website as well. And then teslatakeover.eu is a website that you can go to. So what I brought up here was a um, pigtail cable out of a 2.0 Roadster. This is the portion right here that you normally see that is visible when you open your charge port door, and then you take your Tesla Roadster plug, and you plug that into this oh, section. Oh, it's behind here. your mic. Bear with me here. There we go. All right. So you plug that in, and then you start charging. And in this case, we've got a can senior, which means that you now have a NAX adapter that will allow you to charge your okay. roadster. Hold on. So you're holding it right behind your mic. See the TV screen? Oh, there we go. All right. There you go. There we go. I got to look at my image out there more often. It looks yeah. like. <laughs> So the, uh, this is a can senior, which essentially allows you now to use a NAX connector on a Roadster. Well, we thought about this for a bit. Yeah, you can get, uh, you know, Henry Sharp makes these, and uh, he's got the can senior and the can junior. The junior is the J1772 to Roadster. Senior is the SR or the uh, NAX to the, uh, to the Roadster socket. It occurred to us, why not change this socket to a NAX socket? It doesn't look like it's going to be that hard because what you have is a socket, a mounting flange, and a pigtail cable that connects to the AC connection and the pilot signal. So what we're going to be doing with these two cables, and the reason I say two, there's a difference between the 1.5 Roadster pigtail, charge pigtail, and the uh, 2.0. This is the 2.0. This is the 1.5. The 1.5 has the same socket, same sort of an exit behind the charge port door, but it has a large plug that goes into the PIM, and that's what then um, uh, creates the AC input to the Roadster Power Electronics module. So what we're doing now is we're going to ship these off to New York. They are going to go to the original vendor that made the pigtails, and they're going to recreate these pigtails with a NAX socket on it. So and what we're now going to be able to offer is when your Roadster comes in for repair or service or upgrade, 
one of the options is going to be, do you want to convert it to the next standard? You will immediately um, eliminate the can junior and can senior. It won't be necessary anymore. And um, you'll be able to charge directly from any next destination charger. Now, it's not going to charge from a supercharger. The supercharger is a DC input, high voltage DC input, and the roadsters do not accommodate that. All they can handle is AC input. So stay tuned. We'll be reporting the progress that we're making. These are going off to be reverse engineered uh, by the company that originally made them. And uh, we're going to uh, figure out what it's going to take to put a NAC socket on the end here and then develop a kit that can be installed in your Tesla Roadster to give you NAC's capability. Now, what happens for the people who have some of these uh, higher-valued Roadsters where they'd like to keep the original parts? Good question. Let's get this out of here. So that was one of the first questions that we asked as well. These cars are going collectible. In the world of car collecting, it's about originality. How do you reconcile a modification like this? Well, it depends on how long you're going to keep your Roadster. If it's garage furniture, it's collectible, you never drive it, leave it as is. Okay. If, however, you enjoy driving your Roadster, and you're going to do that a few more years, and you're tired of the hassle of taking adapters with you and trying to find, uh, you know, charge standards and all that, then have it changed. We'll put the old pigtail cable in the trunk for you, and at any point in time you want to change it back because you're about to sell the car as a collector car, it goes back to original. That makes total sense. And then uh, you can... Go get the low, you know, the the Amazon sixty dollar Nax to J seventeen seventy two adapter. Uh, you know, they hold it in your hand, and then you can go to virtually any charger that any other electric car could go to. Then exactly, that's yes. a great idea. So stay tuned because this is um, this is coming fairly soon. Uh, we will have it out on our e store. Um, and uh, so we're not only getting a price on the replacement plugs, and those of you that want to do your own cable repairs, these plugs will be out on our e-store as well. So you can buy those there and do your own fix. Um, all right. Looks like we've covered that fairly well. Any questions? We're good? I think we're good and caught up on questions at this point. Okay. All right, um, here's another interesting image that we can pop up, guys. It is the um, VIN 689-3. Um, we've been talking to Tesla corporate quite a bit about their continued support for Tesla, for the Tesla Roadster. And uh, it continues to improve, which is very, very um, uh, rewarding for us as uh, you know owners because we don't want to see these cars, the support ever end from the company right. that made them. Most definitely. What they're beginning to do, they're still doing the buyback program, but they're telling us that some of these cars now, instead of being crushed or completely disassembled, are being emptied of drivetrain, battery, and the, um, uh, the drive motor and the PEM, and then putting them on display at the Tesla um, uh, service centers. This particular one is a contribution from uh, one of the owners, Mel C., who went to the um, local Arlington, Virginia Tesla Service Center, and they have VIN number 689 on display. There's another image here, 689-1, uh, VIN 689-1. This one's behind glass, and you can see that it uh, enjoys a prominent place at the service center. The plaque there is the next image, which is 689-2, and they even have provided a description somewhat of the history of the Roadster. The 2008 is inaccurate, by the way. This is actually a 2010. Okay. But, you know, we'll, we'll forgive them. And um, there are other service centers that are beginning to display the first-generation Tesla Roadsters. They're also putting in Cybertrucks, and that's where VIN 689-4 comes into play. Uh, and sometimes the Model 3, the Model Y, if they have enough room to do so. So it looks to me there's a uh, level of pride that is beginning to emerge within Tesla. I'm glad to see that with the Roadsters. Uh, it, it's nice to see them uh, show some more respect to their history. 
And uh, this particular picture, of course, shows a lot of thumbprints on the uh, on the cyber yeah. truck. The um, this particular roadster, by the way, we first became aware of it. It was in the Owings Mill, um, um, in the Owings Mill, Maryland uh, service center, and it was in the graveyard outside where it sat a few years in the parking lot. So instead of tearing it completely apart, they began to uh, clean it up and then brought it into the service center on display. And some of the comments, by the way, uh, because we're not the only ones that saw Mel post these pictures. By the way, Mel, thank you for doing that. Uh, one of the comments was, a, um, he said, I've heard of a few locations refurbishing the shells for display instead of parting them out completely. So this is amazing news. Gives me hope that one day these could be back on the road. Now there's another angle. It's quite conceivable that a car that's intact like this, missing ESS battery pack and drivetrain and PEM, mm -hmm. could easily be put back on the road. Oh, it probably could be because those three large components, while they make up most of the drivetrain, uh, they're also very easy to replace. Yeah. And if you think about it, maybe it's a financially driven uh, decision. These things get into the millions of dollar territory as collectibles. It makes sense to put something like this back on the road. And lest people forget that Tesla wants to put out a second generation of their Roadster, what better way to promote the idea of a Roadster than to show their first generation? Yeah. And, you know, what, what we're finding, of course, being in the Roadster business, um, these cars are um, becoming more popular out in the wild. Yes. Um, it's not uncommon when we take them to car shows that people flock around the car. And by the way, those of you that have uh, roadsters here for sale, um, with your permission, we are attending strategic car shows here in the area. And what we're finding is that when we take one of your cars that's for sale out to one of these shows, there's a lot of interest that's generated. Yes. And we'll pass all of that on to you, of course, who's interested and, and why and all that. Another uh, comment here is super happy to see the roadster pride institutionally. Bodes well for the long haul support. Well, it sure does. You know, it, uh, that's just fun to see. I, I really hope that uh, eventually all the service centers end up with roadsters displayed like this white roadster is. Yeah. We have a question there from Instagram. Uh, Krumer says, why are the mounting flanges still made from metal? In this particular case, this was the original socket out of the cars. The new version may not be metal. There may be some composite or, uh, you know, some other method of uh, mm -hmm. mounting. And that's what we're leaving to the designers that are now reverse engineering these two pigtail cables. And then Highlander also has joined us again. Thanks for coming back, Highlander. Um, don't forget to smash that like button, folks, he says. That's right. Please, please like us and uh, let, it, let us know. We appreciate the feedback there. So here's an owner that uh, was going to sell his car on the Roadster matchmaking site. And uh, by the way, it's free. For those of you that are unaware, um, we have actually one that's getting ready to be posted now. But um, he was going to post his Roadster, and he sent me an email yesterday, and he said, um, thanks for the detailed reply, and it's an amazing service that you provide for free. But as I look at the prices that the Roadsters are actually successfully sold for, I think I will hold on to mine a little longer and see what happens. But when I do decide to sell, I know what to um, um, I know what you provide. So my response to him was, "Yeah, the market is definitely soft right now for roadsters. Waiting is prudent. Long term, I'm confident that the uniqueness of this iconic car will prevail and it will become a seller's market again. Let us know when you're ready." You know, we've talked in the past about how uh, the 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 older generation people who, um, people who were in their uh, early fifties up to mid sixties were the ones buying these roadsters fifteen years ago, and so now they're people that are in their mid to late sixties up to their early eighties, and a lot of times it's it's medical issues or just physically can't get in and out of the car anymore, and so there's been some turnover. There's such a small number of roadsters overall. Eventually, that turnover is going to uh, wind itself down. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm positive of that because the people that are buying those roadsters are the same kind of the same type of people. They're the ones that are in their 40s to mid 50s again. You're going to see a wind down uh, after a couple more years, and I think then you're going to see demand spike. Mm-hmm. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, another image, Jesse, is VIN number 920. And uh, this is the one that I was telling you is going to go up for sale here shortly, probably within the next couple of days. Um, it is a Canadian car. It's an obsidian black. And um, asking on it is $95,000 US, not Canadian. That always uh, is a question we get asked. Mm-hmm. It's a 2010 it has 19,500 kilometers, so it's fairly low mileage. And um, the standard charge is 200 kilometers. The CAC is 135. Obsidian black. Um, for those of you that are listing your cars with us, um, there's a suggested series of pictures that sellers or that the uh, potential buyers like to see. Definitely detailed shots of the interior shots of each of the wheels. They want to see how much curb rash there is. Um, When you get a CAC reading, take a picture of the screen. The mileage, take a picture of the console portion that shows the mileage. And then any interior shots, including any wear on the car. Don't want that to be a surprise after they purchased it and, uh, you know, the pictures did not reveal that. Yes. So you want to give full disclosure. Um, we're going to do a newsletter eventually that gives people an idea of what and what the image inventory should be when you're selling a Roadster. Um, if you're, if you're um, not sure, go to the Roadster matchmaking site and just see what kind of images have been posted on some of the ones that have sold. And it'll give you an idea how to uh, get the best presentation for your car. Now on TikTok, we have a question in from North Maze, uh, who asks, how many kilowatts can the Roadster charge and how much kilowatt hour capacity does the battery have? So I'm thinking the kilowatts is how, how fast. Yeah. Well, the, um, uh, the charge input rate is uh, anything from 70 amps for the Clipper Creek charger down to 15 amps for the yellow charge cable. The capacity of a legacy Roadster battery pack, NKWH is 53. For the replacement 3.0 packs, it's actually 80 KWH. And the difference is the original Roadsters could go maybe 180, 190 miles range in standard mode charge. And that means 80% or so, because you don't want to charge them uh, to, um, uh, to range mode very often. With the new battery packs, and that's a good question. Somebody just asked that one of our customers, what can I expect once I get my 3.0 battery pack? We're seeing anywhere from 219 to 230 miles uh, in standard mode charge or 80%. Although this morning I was driving VIN 711, which is our 3.0 pack test mule, and um, it actually got up to 244 miles in standard mode. So it, it does tend to vary. And I'm not terribly surprised because I think Raphael, who got a, you know, he got the uh, 3.0 pack and said that he was up around in range mode, 300 to 305 miles, mm-hmm. which would put you about 240 miles at 80%. Right. Which in his case is very important because he's traveling around the world. Oh, yes. Got to get long distance. Yeah. So on that 70 amp charger, um, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that you're running about um, 12 or 13 kilowatts an hour uh, into the battery. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, let's see. The, um, another car that's for sale that's already posted out there. don't have a picture of that, but it is a um, uh, VIN number 331, Thunder Gray, 2008, 38,000 miles on the odometer. And uh, this one is in the U.S. They are asking, I'm sorry, Canada as well. Yeah, we've got two Canadian cars most recently. They're asking $125,000 for this car. But you may say, well, you know, the other guy's asking ninety-five, dollars uh, And roasters are selling, like on Bring a Trailer, for $71,000. Yeah. Why so high? Well, this one has a recent 3.0 battery upgrade. Brand new battery, in other words, the big propulsion battery. 
And um, so if you subtract what they paid for that, which is $45,000, you've got an $80,000 Roadster that, uh, with a fresh battery, future-proof basically, and you don't have the wait time to get the new battery. Yeah, there's definitely value in that. And that $80,000 in that case, uh, it's right where the market's at right now. Mm -hmm. All right, um, let's see. Can we bring up a picture called Automotive Woman? You know, there are a couple of, well, actually a number of notable females in the EV space. We've got Kim Java, we've got mm -hmm. Supercar Blondie, mm -hmm. and we have Automotive Woman. This is uh, Juliana uh, Ciovitti, and uh, she has a YouTube channel called Automotive Women. Um, she did a video or a podcast with me, and what we were talking about was the, the GMC battery bunker. Why do we have it? Is it underground? Why is it a bunker? What's its purpose? And uh, it's an informative video that you might want to um, uh, review. Um, it is out on her YouTube channel under Automotive Woman. And um, what we talk about is the reasons for a battery bunker for an EV shop. There are a number of reasons. Whenever you take any battery element out of a propulsion battery pack, you have removed it from its safe environment, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the battery safety monitoring systems. And when you start to repair it, you're going to need to do certain functions like charge it out of the car. The car has some very complicated algorithms that track safety. They don't want vehicle fires, basically. Right. When you take that out of that element, you have now introduced a, an additional element of risk. And we decided that we're going to build a battery bunker and isolate and separate any battery activity in a separate building. It's a 40-foot uh, steel sea container, completely lined with drywall and uh, heat and temperature sensors, charging systems. And should any kind of mishap occur, it will be confined to that battery bunker and uh, not affect the, um, uh, the main operations, all the cars that are in there for service and the tooling and uh, you know, all right. the rest. Well, and if, if something really happens bad to that battery bunker, I mean, just close it up. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It'll glow cherry red and the fire department will cool it and quench it eventually, and, uh, but it's not going to, to destroy cars or um, a property. Exactly. So we also find that the insurance companies are going to become very laser focused on this level of uh, additional uh, tooling in any kind of a shop that is uh, being insured for electric vehicle repair. Well, anytime it makes the press that a car has caught fire, uh, that an EV has caught fire, um, we know that EVs do not catch fire as often as ICE vehicles, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's almost like when, when you have an airplane crash, airplane crashes always make the news, mm -hmm. even though airplanes crash so much less than cars. Well, same thing here. And every Chevy Bolt that has caught fire or every other, uh, every other vehicle that's ever had a, a fire that's electric um, causes the insurance companies to get skittish. This helps to mitigate that skittishness. We say, hey, we're taking anything that might have a, an, an element of risk and we're putting it aside so that if that bad risk happens, we've already taken steps to help mitigate the losses. And Gruber Motor Company actually has been a leader in a number of fields, as have all of our other companies. We mm -hmm. enjoy that position. And uh, it's one of the reasons we have social media is because we document a lot of these developments that we're involved in. But the auto shop of the future is aptly named because eventually the insurance companies are going to uh, realize that they have elevated risks with EV shops. They're going to require something like this and the premiums will be affected without it. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> All right. Um, we talk about open vehicle management system often for the Tessa Roadster, and the reason is it is a um, great way to keep tabs on your Roadster when you're out of town, on vacation, um, and you're, um, you're not sure how well the, the vehicle is being charged or taken care of. Um, it is a vital component, we feel, 
And um, I realized this morning how vital because they just placed another order for 20 of them. So it looks like we've run out yet again. Um, this is a little black box that essentially sits underneath the passenger compartment by your VMS unit. And it allows you to maintain connection to your vehicle through your cell phone. When you're on vacation, it will tell you if, what the state of charge is, what if any error codes are being thrown. Mm -hmm. And you can then immediately be proactive and take action to have that circuit breaker reset after a thunderstorm or find out why it's not being charged. It's going to prevent brick roadsters. It's going to keep you on top of what's going on, and it's money well spent. So again, it's one of our recommendations when the cars come in and uh, we are restocking and we'll have another 20 here within the next week or so. Well, and as our EV preserve business uh, gets up and running where we have the automotive storage, we're going to require any owners of uh, probably not only roadsters, but any high-end electric car, we're going to tell them you have to have one of these in place so that we can adequately monitor and you can adequately monitor your car at all times. Yeah, good point. Good point. So I have an interesting story here for you. Um, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, l last year actually, a Tesla Roadster was at the Fort Lauderdale Service Center, and uh, it had just uh, gotten a 3.0 battery pack replacement. It waited for a while to get that. It was sitting there bricked, and um, it was almost ready to go home, and the car was stolen. And uh, it turned up a, a couple days later or so. It was at an impound lot. And uh, from there, um, things really began to develop. Um, the reasons for the theft are still unclear. Were, were the keys left in the car? Was it inside the service center? Was it outside the service center? Um, how did they gain access, you know? Yeah. And uh, is it bricked? Um, so um, a number of these issues are have not yet come to light, but the car currently um, is still at the service center um, the, um, uh, the owner has been given some options. And, um, at this point I recommended probably the best option since it appears to be bricked at this point, even with a new battery pack is see if there's a buyback, um, opportunity for you, because at some point he was uh, even thinking about selling it. So, um, at this point it's still in play. We don't know how it's going to play out. Um, it is VIN 541 and it's at the Fort Lauderdale uh, Service Center. Um, Tesla has been great about uh, getting insurance involved and uh, taking care of any costs like the retrieval of the vehicle, bringing it back to the service center, and, um, but it's still not resolved. I'm sad to hear that it's still not resolved. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you're right, if it wasn't bricked, it probably is by now because it's been a f several months. Yeah. So we can, we can hope for the best. I do hope that it, this gets resolved quickly. All right. Let's see. Do I have an image of that? No, I was going to show you an image of what we've done with the Tesla Roadsters that are waiting to go back home. And uh, because we're cleaning so many of them and detailing them before they go, we have these large plastic bags that we put over the Roadster, which essentially is like a sock that keeps it clean uh, prior to departure. Um, final thing that I have w uh, for you here is the uh, Tesla Cybertruck that visited Gruber Motor Company. Um, there's a video out on our YouTube channel now, done by Cass, by the way. W where did Cass go? Did she leave? Yeah, she doesn't stay for this podcast. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Cass is one of our editors, and she is just top-notch. She's very proud of this video. So if you get a chance, go to the YouTube channel, watch it. It, um, it has what's called algorithm-friendly music, uh, which is a oh, new I'm social media well, term. So, <laughs> so the, the algorithm-friendly music one is going out on TikTok and Instagram, some of those other ones that don't uh, hit us for the copyright. The one that's out on our YouTube channel is the one that's copyright-free music, and that's the one that we're, we're promoting uh, as of yesterday. Okay. okay. All right. So on the other platforms, we can use algorithm-friendly music, which fools the algorithms into promoting it more. Well, it's it's recent copywritten music, so it's new release music that's really popular and trending. So that's why the algorithm lo likes it. Trending. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I see. It's not the kind of music, Mark, that I think you or I would warm up to. 
It, I don't know. Am I going out on a limb here? It's not, you're, <laughs> no, you're not going out on too much of a limb. It's not I, uh, classical. No, it's not classical music or uh, done with the kind of beat that I'm used to. But no, I, I, I've learned as my children grew up to expand my horizons when it came to my musical tastes. Uh-huh. But even having said that, there are certain musical styles that I like more than others. Okay. So anyway, good video. Um, what's intriguing about it is the Tessa Roadster was done in a Laguna Blue wrap, which is highly reflective. And um, our photographers there, including one of the mechanics, Mike is a great photographer, yes. were able to catch reflections of the Roadster in the Cybertruck, which inspired an image that we posted for a while called um, Roadster Echoes in the DNA or something like that. Yes, I saw that particular post and a, a fabulous post. It, I, a quick shout out to Mike here. I, it, it, we take pictures, I take yeah. pictures. He knows how to tell a story in video form, in still video form. Yeah, great way to describe it. And you know what I find with great photographers, or I guess any artist, they see things that we can't see. Yes. It pops out to them, you know, uh, instinctively. Yes. And uh, then suddenly, once they show it to you, you realize, yeah, that is really cool. Why didn't I see that, you know? Exactly, exactly. So we're, um, we're at the top of the hour here. Um, the German, did we talk about the um, takeover in Europe? We talked about podcast. the takeover in Europe in the, in, in, the last in the last podcast. Let's give it another we, plug. We, we talked briefly about it at the beginning of this. Let's give it one more plug, though. It's okay. May 24th. 26th. and 26 is the official dates. And yes. I'll be there the 24th. Um, great place to hang out if you love Teslas. They're going to have all the Teslas represented, including some roadsters in a setting that is uh, from the Sound of Music, the Alpine Hills of uh, near Salzburg, Austria. Uh, Alpine Lakes, it's a ski resort area, actually. And um, a lot of guest speakers will be there. John Stringer is going to be there as well. He does a podcast as well, and some of the other influencers, some of the service organizations will be there. But, um, and a number of clubs around Europe, Portugal, France, uh, the, from Scandinavia, uh, the Netherlands, of course, and uh, it's well worth attending. So um, if you're in that neck of the woods, May 25th and 26th is when the festivities are occurring. And uh, we'd love to see you there and meet you in person. And if you're not in that neck of the woods, uh, I know that we're working on having a podcast live during the time that you're there. So thanks it, for mentioning it, that. It yes. may be uh, it may well, be so that it's on that a out. on a Saturday, the 25th, uh, that we have it here in the states. But we'll we'll we're going to figure that out and we'll get that announced right away. Well, do you know what day you're speaking? Did, did they tell you yet, Pete? It's Saturday. Yes. Oh, it is Saturday, Saturday afternoon. So and... what is Saturday afternoon here though? That's going to be like. 2 a.m. for us? No, they're about nine hours difference. Yeah, nine hours behind us, so it'd be fairly early morning. Okay. Yeah, by late afternoon. And uh, should we set some sort of a, um, a uh, dare? Um, I'm thinking what we might do. People have never seen me yodel. So if we get to a certain number of subscribers, <laughs> I will yodel on this podcast. What would that number be to make it Wait, worth my while? Do you have a secret yodeling skill or what? <laughs> well, it's in the blood. I was born in Bavaria. Uh, okay. I thought that was like a Swedish thing or something. I don't know why oh, I thought no, that. Oh, no, no. It's Bavarian, yeah. And Austrian and uh, Swiss, you know. Uh, all, okay. Uh, from, from, from the Alpine population. We, we, I want to see you yodel, so we're going to have to figure that one out. All right. We'll think about it, and in the next podcast, we'll talk about what that, uh, what that dare and that challenge will be. Well, we want to thank you all for uh, joining us. Highlander says kindness is always free, and he Thank always you, Highlander. Nails it. Yes. We'll see you next week. Take care.